It is the 6th of November, 2015, and this is episode 32 of the Unseen Podcast. This is tonight's host, Paul Carr. And uh, let me introduce the panel real quick, then I have a few introductory words, and then we will get on to tonight's subject, which is going to be, broadly speaking, science fiction. So, tonight we have, from Australia, David Grigg. Hi, how are you? Good. And from New Jersey, Patrick Festa. Hello, hello, hello. And from... The skeptical part of Oklahoma, <laughs> James Garrison. Hello, everybody. And Nick Nielsen from... Hello, Oklahoma. Paul. Hello, Paul, and hello to the Unseen Podcast. Now, these guys have all been on before, so I won't ask them to tell you much about themselves at this point. If you want to know more about the panelists, go to unseenpodcast.com and click on panelists and all their bios are right there if they've supplied one if they haven't well then it's just a big deep dark mystery who they are um okay a couple of things i'd like to mention before we get started uh october was a big month for the unseen podcast we shattered our monthly download record a lot of that was due to episode 27 which was the mars one candidates uh and but it wasn't entirely that that was about 500 downloads there were a quite a few more that uh, were available. So we're doing well. Thank you for listening. Please keep listening. If there is anything that you might think would stop you from listening, let us know what it is. Uh, we'd love feedback. You can you can provide us feedback on this episode at unseenpodcast.com. Just go right to the episode uh, entry and, and go ahead and make your comment. Uh, or any other episode entry you can comment on. And we would really like to see that. We have a subreddit, and we just recently added a Google Plus listeners community. Just started this week. Uh, not many people there yet, but please, uh, if you're interested in that, I'll have a link to it uh, at the at unseenpodcast.com, and go there, and uh, you can make comments, you can suggest, you can ask questions, you can do anything you want at that community. Anything that's not spam will be encouraged. Uh, I'd like to make one more quick note is that we did have a new episode of the wow signal this week came out it was an interview with martin elvis who's an astrophysicist at the harvard smithsonian center for astrophysics he has focused his recent research on asteroid mining and we had a, a nice discussion about asteroid mining that is available at wowsignalpodcast.com it's already that particular episode is doing very well in terms of downloads and and page views so uh, and I'm quite proud of it. I think it, it well, thanks largely to Dr. Elvis, it, it came out really well. So uh, please go visit that. Now tonight, we are going to be talking about uh, everybody's favorite subject, science fiction. Of course, we're not just going to be talking about the new Star Wars movie or, you know, plot holes in Mr. Robot or whatever. We're going to talk about what science fiction means, what it, what it really is, and how it inspires and motivates and what it gets wrong, what it gets right, and, and how that is productive. And, and so let's get started. Uh, who wants to go first? What, let's talk about, first of all, how do we tell science fiction apart from anything, any other kind of literature? Uh, can I put in something here? Um, sure. The, one of the definitions that's worth going back to is one written by James Blish under his uh, alias William Aisling Jr. back in the 1950s. And uh, his definition is, and I quote from his book, a science fiction story is a story built around human beings with a human problem and a human solution which would not have happened at all without its scientific content. So maybe that's worth debating whether we think that's a real definition or not. What do you think of that? Hmm. So there, uh, there, there has to be content that is explicitly scientific? Yes. Okay. Or, 
but but I think the key there is that it's about people. You know, it's it's about human beings. It's got to be a human story. But you know, perhaps that's a definition of good science fiction as opposed to what science fiction is. But what, what I'd like to hear what some of the other people have to say about what they how would they would define science fiction. How about you, Paul? Well, I think that's not a bad start. I, I really think that there's not a bright line. Uh, it could be because, first of all, not all science fiction is set in the future. Uh, and some science fiction just sort of throws in futuristic gadgetry without really exploring the science. Uh, which, frankly, I love some of those stories. But <laughs> I guess that's what we'd call space opera, right? Where you know the guy has a ray gun and a rocket ship. We don't know where it came from, or how it works, but uh, it, it makes the story more fun. Uh, Ray Bradbury wrote a lot of really compelling stories that had a rocket ship in them, but <laughs> there was really no science behind the rocket ship. He just the rocket ship lands, it takes you somewhere, right? Um, so. I would say science fiction, the way I, you know, I would distinguish between hard science fiction and soft science fiction, but maybe that's too much of a, too much of a fine line for some people. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and then things like, for example, things like Lord of the Rings, not science fiction at all. No. It's a fantasy. It's it's a fantasy world, but there this this concept of constructing a world that is not the world that we live in is still part usually part of it, right? I mean that when you say that that's that every science fiction author either has well, I mean William Gibson doesn't really do that. He kind of uses the world we have, but uh, and sort of puts strange things into it. But uh, there's a lot of well, world- uh- yeah, a lot of science fiction is like that, though, isn't it? I mean, a lot of it uh, is, starts in the in our world with just one little change made, and that's 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 kind of an interesting branch of science fiction. Really, is is where you just take one one little thing and just turn it around and say, well, if only this were different, um, or or here is our existing world, and and if if we, if we take a particular trend and we just extrapolate it a little bit further, you know, if if this goes on. How will things be? So, well, science fiction doesn't have to be set in space. Yeah. But space opera is space opera is more like Star Wars, right? Where we have futuristic gadgetry, but there's no science content, right? There's no we we don't this, the the gadgetry just there, and it makes things more visually exciting or more fun, but it doesn't I really. Like, I like Dave's David's uh, uh, definition that he gave, but um, it seems to me that science fiction fiction even mystery even you know novels of any kind always have human stories because it's always about us um the difference between fiction and science fiction of course is that there's some sort of science content and sometimes uh, uh, sometimes it is gadgetry sometimes it's not i mean it, it could be space travel in itself as science i mean you know and i think there has to be um, like a balance between believability and speculation, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, Star Trek always uh, seems to run a fine balance, but sometimes they, uh, they they exaggerate way too much just to just to get the production going. But uh, it, I think it always has to do with the human story. I'm, um, I'm, I just finished listening to a, a murder mystery uh, by Rob, uh, Robert Galbraith, who happens to be J.K. Rowling, by the way. She created this uh, character, uh, um, um, Cormoran Strike, who is a private eye, and it's about the human story, but it's completely fiction. There's no science except for the science of, of you know, uh, forensics and stuff like that. But uh, um, when it comes to science fiction, to make something a little bit more far fetched to sound believable, the writer who employs some known science to the speculation usually gets the story more believable, like. Um, 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 the the uh, Formic Wars series, the three series that that preceded, well, as a prequel, written later than the than the Ender's Game, uh, about the, the 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 alien spaceship coming in at near light uh, light speed, and they had the free miners out there, you know, mining the asteroids and things like that. So he didn't stretch the the uh, he didn't go to warp speed or anything like that, like Star Trek went and did, which is an exaggeration of you know non science. <laughs> Um, but he did approach the idea of possibly 
going half the speed of light or something to that effect. So I, th- I think it always includes human stories, but it, it's depending on how much sciencey it is, you know, whether it's totally far fetched or whether it's believable, sometimes it can can affect the story depending on the balance between the human story and 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 the uh, the the the, fan- the fantasy of it. Yeah, well, it's okay with me if it's far fetched. I, mean, I I like to read Werner Vinge, and his stuff is really far fetched. Although he makes a good argument that it that it's possible. Uh, so, I mean, d- does it matter? Does it matter how far in the future the uh, author is looking, or how near in the future? I, I don't think it does. It it, it 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 we could have science fiction set in the past, surely. Um, I mean, even if you look back at H.G. Wells and Jules Verne, it's you know set in uh, the uh, the Victorian era. Uh, yeah. It's still science fiction. Is 1984 science fiction? I think it kind Absolutely. of is. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But it's not viewed as a genre novel, however. No, it's not. Uh, no. And the same thing with with Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five. You know, it has science fiction elements to it, but most people consider it mainstream literary rather than science fiction genre. Yeah, well, if your English teacher liked it, it's not science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just a kind of snobbery, isn't it? it what, what we're saying is, is that it, it can't be science fiction if it's any good. That, that is it, one it, of the prejudices, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, which, which is pretty, pretty poor going. Uh, yeah, there's I a mean, lot of very fine writers in science fiction. <laughs> absolutely. Well, you, you uh, it, it, it comes down to, I think, to what, the, what do you think the purpose of science fiction is and wh- whether... Uh, well, perhaps it shouldn't have a purpose other than to entertain, but it can entertain at the same same time as actually making you think. And that's what's always appealed to me about science fiction is it makes you think about things. And, uh, you know, the, the whole idea of, of if this goes on, let's take a current trend and say, if this were taken to the extreme, what would what would society be like? What would it be like to live in, in a world like that? Well, that, I don't that's, know. that's the kind of stuff that I don't makes know how you many, think. many of you guys have seen Mr. Robot? Uh it's set in the present day. Uh, it's about hacking and cybersecurity and and anarchy and, and it a group that kind of is kind of like anonymous, uh, trying to bring down the power structure of society. And you know it, but the technical part of the story is very is critical to the storyline. In every episode, so I guess in some sense I think that's science fiction too. Even oh, though it's it's these. very gritty and set in New York with drug dealers and and you know all kinds and sexual perverts and all kinds of other things going on. But, well, let's just say, in other words, there's 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 science fiction. For example, I'll give you an example. Uh, I gave the example of Orson Scott Card's um, um, the trilogy of uh, the the Formic Wars. Where uh, him and, and his co-writer try to stick to uh, uh, at least plausible science, but take uh, Anne McCaffrey, where she went into the realm of fantasy with the creatures that actually breathe fire, with her with her uh, um, um, you know the the, the dragon series, uh, the the Pern series series. And then she turned. She also did a an actual science fiction, which was uh, Freedom's Landing series, which was all science fiction. But she didn't pay too much attention to the plausibility of of, of how fast they were traveling between different stars. They, they, you know, they basically got there in almost no time. You know, almost like Star Trek. Well, yeah, but, Star Trek doesn't pay much attention to that either. <laughs> the story was very good. The stories were very good because it was a human story. It was about an entire colony being started on another planet that these aliens that. that invaded earth and took him to this place so so there's a balance so so she was able to reach the human story balance without worrying about the technical you know space travel whereas the orson scott card side it was a human story and he had more plausible science it's 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 hard to, you know I, i'm no writer so i really don't understand how they do it because i would be i wouldn't be here today i would be writing million dollar books if i was half as good as they were but uh, but there is there is a strange balance between the two well, right. the thing on uh, Anne McCaffrey is when she was not not in the initial three books because she wrote those in college, but uh, later on she went and spoke to geneticists and astronomers and people like that to find out 
how something like the Dragons of Pern could be created. So she, right. the, the right. later books are actually based on kind of like what Scott Sigler does, based on actual techniques that we can do to an extent now and extrapolate it out into what we should be able to do in the future. Right. The Dragon Rider started out as a more or less as a fantasy series. Right. And then you find out they're actually humans from Earth that were fleeing the war. They get they're, they're stranded on that planet. They were they were from mm -hmm. other planets too. But she also did the astronomy thing, where they created the uh, stone to to you know to to uh, um, tell them when when uh, the the rogue planet was coming. The ice stones. Well, that that's, yeah. that definitely makes it science fiction. I think it, it seems to me that the business about the the, the science content is is that it, you just have to get it to the point where it, it doesn't offend people's uh, willingness to suspend disbelief. You know, it just has to be plausible enough. I mean, most of science fiction involves science, which is impossible or, and will probably always be impossible. But as, as long as you're not uh, stopping the reader in their tracks, then I think we the, the most good writers of science fiction really are using that... Uh, that element really is just a, as a means to an end to, to tell a story and make people think about a particular issue or a particular aspect of, of society or human life. Um, and I think that's what good science fiction does. Um, and it's nice if the science isn't too, um, too ridiculous, but uh, it doesn't have to be 100% plausible in my view anyway. No, of course you not. You always get a freebie. Well, I think if, if the if the writer gets too hung up on plausibility, they'll never get started. Right? The, right? I mean, even very hardcore guys like like Gregory Benford uh, have to, at some point, just say, "Well, this step is pure magic," and <laughs> and move on. Uh, because you can always you can always fall back on Arthur C. Clarke, of course. Um, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology is going to look like magic. So. Right? Yeah. <laughs> And I always thought that my my, uh, my when when I was reading Harry Potter to my kids, which I read every night for several years, <laughs> so they fell asleep. Uh, I kept telling myself, "Well, this is just a very very advanced technology these wizards have that they somehow inherited, and uh, and they they don't even they're not even aware that it's technology. They just think it's uh, what do you mean incantations? <laughs> Sorry." My, my, Michael Michael Drought, who has a great set of lectures on science fiction, uh, says that the corollary of, of Clark's law is that any sufficiently debased magic is indistinguishable from technology. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, uh, but you know, the all, the magic has rules and it has requirements and it has, and if you do certain things wrong, it won't work. And and uh, you need a a bright technically adroit person like Hermione to make, get all these things to work, you know? Uh, so, uh, it, it was, and you have to go to school to learn it. So, you know, it, it was, in a sense, it was a kind of technology. Uh, I've always, I've always thought that, uh, that wizards, uh, and, and magicians were, uh, simply just, uh, programmers and coders, you know, they're, they're well, hackers. If you look and, at um, Terry Pratchett's fiction, he really, he goes, he goes all out with that idea. Uh, you know, they build, they build machines that do magic and so forth. Uh, oh, hex. Yeah. Terry, Terry Pratchett really, he ran with that idea very hard uh, that it was, it was really just kind of a, a technology. Uh, but but he's a, he's a good example because he, he uses this kind of comic fantasy world to make a, to make some very good points about real life and about human life and about society I and mean, if you've read um uh going postal for example that's a very serious critique of of uh, public versus private enterprise uh and and the benefit of, to society of of uh, letting um corporate greed take over or the, the, sorry the negative aspects to society of letting corporate greed take over um and who would have thought of, thought of that in a, in a comic fantasy you know you sort of you laugh at the jokes but behind it there's a very serious intent Oh yeah, he was like that. Yeah, he, he had. Uh, it was kind of like it had to be a. It had to be funny, but it beyond that he could 
do whatever he wanted and make whatever commentary he wanted on it, it, the disc world was was remarkably like earth in many ways <laughs> in spite of all the magic absolutely yeah i, I miss him <laughs> I, we all miss him i think i think his yeah. daughter made the right decision that uh she's not going to write any more disc world novels and, and let it stop where it stopped yep i think so it um, so, okay. So we, we've kind of beaten around the idea of what is science fiction a little bit. Uh, anybody want to add anything to that or shall we move on to other topics? I'd like to just add briefly to address the believability or plausibility aspect we were talking about earlier. Uh, as I think that there, we can make a distinction, uh, that's relevant to what David Grigg was talking about earlier of starting out with some, the world as we know it and changing one little thing and extrapolating it. That's one way of securing believability or plausibility. But the, the very different tradition are the are 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 the, the world builders, people like Frank Herbert and Doom, who creates this elaborate uh, uh, world with filled with all kinds of arcane and interesting details and quoting books that don't exist. And and if you can if you can create something in that depth of detail, uh, it that gives it a plausibility, but it's a completely different kind of plausibility that you have from starting with the world that it is and changing one thing and extrapolating from there. Yeah. Yes. I was going to say one thing I'd like to add to that definition, because David was saying, you know, it's about human problems and human answers. I would say the answers or even the problems are technology based. Because, I mean, in most fantasy books, it's human problems. It's human answers. I read um, Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series. You know, yeah, end of the world type of thing. But it's also a guy who's got multiple girlfriends. And, you know, everybody's got their own little personal problems that they're trying to deal with throughout the entire book. By just the definition of, you know, human problems, human answers, this would fall into the that definition but it is definitely a sword and sorcery type of book yeah, yeah. So I, I would say there has to be a technology base one way or the other yeah. well you know ursula k Le Guin would do that uh she would have some kind of technology that gets you into the situation and then it would be basically very much an ordinary you know i would say ordinary but it'd be it would be uh literature it would be a story about about humans and uh you know, the left-handed darkness. A lot of that is is a journey across a an Arctic wasteland. It has nothing to. There's hardly any technology at all. Uh, so, you know, they, but, that can but, vary. But, but but the the real key to that story is the whole business of looking at a society where, if you like, one thing has changed, and that is that in this society there there is no distinction between the genders. Uh, you have a, a a race of beings, a race of humans. And that's the important point, I think, a race of humans who uh, can be of either gender. So it, it's it, and then she tries to t tries to tease out what a society of people like that would be like. And so if you like that, the technology is sociology, genetics, I don't know. But uh, she tells it. She tells a very human story with a very human so solution. I mean, if you don't cry at the end when Estravan dies, you know, you're not you have a heart of stone. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a great work. Yeah. So, by the way, David, that was a spoiler. <laughs> oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> if you haven't read the book by now. <laughs> the book's only been out about 40 years, right? We got it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Star Trek yeah. Generation did an episode on that. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, if you guys haven't read Le Guin, uh, uh, get a hold of her stuff. It's, uh, it's very literary science fiction. If, if I can name drop for a second, I was incredibly fortunate 40 years ago to be uh, at a writer's workshop uh, in Melbourne uh, run by Ursula Le Guin. And uh, so we spent a week uh, a week there with a whole bunch of uh, aspiring writers and uh, Ursula was uh, trying to teach us how to write. And uh, it was a great experience. It really oh. was. Oh. Okay. Uh, so now let's kind of... Maybe we should tell some personal stories. I mean, 
you know, when did you first encounter science fiction and what did it do for you when you, I mean, probably all of us when we were young, read our first science fiction story. Uh, who wants to go first? Uh, I, I could go first if you like. Sure. Um, I, th I think science fiction as, as such came a little later, but I started uh, really reading fantasy novels, uh, things like um, Edith Nesbitt's uh, books written in the Edwardian era, the um, you know, uh, Five Children in It, and uh, the story of the Sam uh, story of the amulet. Um, uh, I just read those books again and again. So that was my equivalent, I guess, of, of Harry Potter uh, in, in in that era. Not, I, not that I was alive in the Edwardian era, you understand. It was, she wrote the books back then. But then um, I think what happened to me was I got caught up in reading comic books. So I started to read a lot of Superman, you know, mm -hmm. those sort of uh, DC comics. And they all obviously have a science fictional premise. You know, he's an alien coming from a, a planet which is blown up. And so that really sort of really got me into the, the science fiction mode so that when I finally weaned myself off comics, um, I started to look uh, around the library to find something vaguely similar and uh, spotted the Golanks yellow covered uh, SF novels in the library and uh, started to read just about every one of those. I remember reading um, Arthur Clarke's City and the Stars at, at about the age of about 12. It's pretty mind-blowing, yeah. <laughs> mind-blowing book to read at that sort of age. That, that's that's kind of my introduction to it anyway. What, what about you? Well, I remember, uh, I don't remember exactly what the first science fiction book I read was, uh, but I remember a lot of Asimov early on when I was about 12, uh, and a lot of iRobot, and a lot of uh, Foundation, which, um, and and all that kind of really worked for me, and I thought, this is really cool. Then I read uh, The Gods Themselves, which has large sections in which there are no humans at all. Some very strange species really mess with my mind. <laughs> I had to take a break after that. Uh, and then I, I read a lot of Ray Bradbury, of course. But Ray, Ray Bradbury was kind of like, uh, I don't know. It wasn't, I, I don't. I still don't think of it as science fiction, not even the Martian Chronicles. Uh, it was more fantasy and... Uh, but I love the stories. I thought the things like Dandelion Wine were just fantastic. I really, this when I was about 13 or so, really, really uh, found it moving. Uh, went on from there to Heinlein, which is much more manly stuff. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but then somebody said, you should read this one by Heinlein. And it was Stranger in a Strange Land. That also messed with my head too much. <laughs> I had to. It took me a while to come off of that one. Uh, what about you, Patrick? Well, I'm embarrassed to say that I'm not that well read. Um, and, and my science fiction started in my childhood off the TV. Uh, it was a revelation in my in my teens or late teens even to find out that a lot of these stories are like like the, the Goosebump series and stuff were were taken from short stories of science fiction writers and stuff. I was like, oh my goodness. And then and then the day I discovered that, for example, I don't remember when this was, I was probably just before 20, when I when I discovered that uh, uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep from, from Philip K. Dick was actually the the the, the movie Blade Runner. Uh, I, I, I completely freaked. I said, oh my God, what have I been missing here? And I started picking up these books and and I couldn't remember one author from another except for Philip K. Dick, who happens to be one of my favorites, um, because uh, the radio station used to carry around here used to carry. Uh, uh, I used to work uh, midnight shift, and at five o'clock in the morning, he would have the uh, Hour of the Wolf with Jim Freund, and uh, he read a few things. Amongst them was the Electric Ant from Philip K. Dick. Another one was Cord Wiener Smith's um, 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 The Game of Rat and Dragon. Um, and this is, I was already, obviously I was already in my late twenties by this time when, when I started working. Um, and, uh, there was of course the, the, the Ursula Gwynn stuff, you know, so, um, Jim Freund is responsible for me freaking out and saying, oh my God, what have I been missing all these years? Hmm. Other than that, it was, when I was a kid, it was lost in space, Star Trek and, you know, off the TV, Twilight Zone, you know. Well, I think Twilight Zone was probably the first time I ever saw science fiction myself. You know, uh, uh, probably, I, probably everybody remembers that episode where uh, 
the girl who played Ellie May on Beverly Hillbillies was a. Uh, <laughs> uh, remember, well, I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't seen it. You know, the whole generation haven't seen it yet, but uh, uh, she plays a person who's having surgery to try to fix her face. And oh, that was <laughs> really, yeah. Oh my goodness! And of course, there are lots of other science fiction stories in Twilight Zone. Well, you know, I, when I was 12, Earth, I mean, um, Angela Cartwright is, um, um, I think, approximately exactly my age. Um, and, of course, I had a crush on Penny. You know. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> and uh, with the new Lost in Space movie, uh, they, they gave her a cameo appearance along with a bunch of others uh, as a journalist or something to that effect. But, uh, yeah, Angela Cartwright was Penny, and I was the same age as her, and I – was in love with her and I kept watching Lost in Space, you know, 12 years old, 12, 11 years old, whatever I was. <laughs> so that's basically where I started off is with the TV. Well, uh, yeah. And of course, I remember Lost in Space as well. Uh, that was, we didn't have Doctor Who in, in the US back then, but we had Lost in Space and the robot. And I had never, and, and it took me many, many years before I saw things like uh, Forbidden Planet. Uh, or um, what was the one? Um, what was that one with the um, the neutrinos, the the tr- the, the, the green face people, and the, the triangular thing in the jig? Oh, you got me there. Oh, I can't think of the name of it. Anyway, uh, let's move on to uh, move on to James. James, I know you've done some. You read some science fiction <laughs> in your day. Um, a wee bit. Uh, what? probably got me started on it was the first movie my dad and pretty much the only one I think he ever took me to was the original Star Wars when that came out Uh, we happened to be in Phoenix so we were able to go and see it when it came out Uh, after that it was because reading I'm just going to say reading was kind of frowned on in my house Uh, but the original Star Trek, Lost in Space, um, <clears throat> then some of the stuff from the 80s. But uh, I read when I got into you know the higher grades. I read Asimov. Read a little bit of uh, Bradbury. Read. I mean, as it stands right now, I think I've got around 300 Star Wars books in my book collection. Uh, I've it's kind of hard to determine exactly, you know, what the first thing I read was, but I mean, I've always had a fascination uh, with science and this Star Wars and Star Trek are my first two loves, to be honest. That's what started everything. And I'm, I'm just in a wreck of my brain and I've got so many books flitting around in my head. I cannot recall the first one I read or even the most recent one. So, no, yeah, that's probably the most boring answer I think I've given in the whole podcast series so far. Uh, <laughs> after thought, but, after thought, I'm doing some teachers an injustice. In junior high school <laughs> it was uh, we read for it was a required required that I can't talk required reading. Um, uh, not, uh, no, not 1984. It was uh, Fahrenheit 451, and mm-hmm. then I think a couple years later, uh, probably just entering high school, it was 1984. I just remembered that. I'm sorry I forgot about that before. <laughs> so my first okay. two readings, it was English class. All right. It looks like it's uh, Nick's turn. What was what turned you on to sci-fi? I'm stepping in. I'm pretending to be Paul right now. Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> like uh, David Griggs' experience, I read a lot of comic books as a young child. And I remember the the adults, as it were, at the time, called them funny books. And I read a few of the the Heckle and Jekyll and Dennis the Menace, but over the years, my reading tended to get toward the science fiction-y comics. And that prepared the ground for reading the books. The actual first science fiction novel I read, I remember very clearly because my mom used to bring home books from the library, and uh, my sisters and I would all just plow through them and see what was available. And uh, my one one time, my mom brought a no, science fiction novel, it was some, some moon exploration. I don't remember the title or the author, and I read that, and that uh, 
just like flipped a switch and I immediately segued into the Heinlein juvenile novels of which I read almost all and a lot of Lester Del Rey. Uh, I read Asimov, but not the foundation books that Paul read, but the, the Lucky Star books, which were a lot like the Heinlein juvenile. So I, I, I consumed an enormous amount of the Heinlein juvenile type novels. Who was the editor that was so famous that worked with Heinlein? Um, can't remember his name right now, but John he w. was. Campbell? Yeah, yeah, John, John Campbell. The people who were mentored by Campbell and all produced pretty much science fiction of a type that was very similar to uh, the the Highland Juveniles were, were my basis. And then I branched out into Paul Anderson, uh, Clifford Simak. I liked for the story. So he doesn't. He was not big on the technology, but on the story aspect uh, that sometimes verged over into fantasy. Uh, so, but I've come to realize that my my science fiction background is extremely dated because I read all this enormous amount of science fiction novels uh, uh, up through the 70s and early 80s, and then just stopped. Uh, so since then, I've read, I've watched a lot of science fiction films and uh, continued in touch with it in that way. And sometimes I will read about science fiction, but it's been a long time since I've actually read a novel through. Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I got out of touch with it for quite a long time, too, because uh, I don't know. I, why did I do that? I probably uh, maybe I thought it was a childish thing. I don't know. But um, I, I I regret that. I wish I had kept up with it. And, then, of course, then, you know, the whole cyberpunk thing came along with uh, with people like William Gibson, who were writing uh, novels about technology in our own time and they're saying look you know things are moving so fast now that you don't need to make up a future you, <laughs> just the present is is weird enough and uh you know that so you have things like novels like neuromancer where the guy's only really you know it's very slight projection into the future I bought a copy of Neuromancer for a friend after I'd stopped uh, reading science fiction just because I knew he, he still did read it and I'd heard how famous it was, but I didn't actually read it myself. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a little bit of, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's projection beyond what we have now, but the idea that you can plug your brain directly into the internet, that's not that far away. Uh, you know, no, there are experiments already. So, you know, so, uh, and, and then what that will result in, in terms of, uh, I mean, I, to me, uh, Mr. Robot is, is just one step below that. I mean, he's not, he doesn't have his brain plugged into the internet, but he's, he's, uh, he uses the internet as a sort of a vigilante type of, uh, activity. And, uh, he, um, you know, the, the idea that there's going to be a whole class of people who, uh, live below the radar of the power structure who, you know, who are, whose skills are extremely valuable and they're sort of a un- black market for their abilities. That's kind of, that's pretty interesting. Uh, so, and, and probably most of them are Chinese <laughs> or Japanese or, you know, but don't, you know, not, not Americans. Uh, something that, uh, pretty common theme in a lot of the stories. I suppose one issue we haven't discussed, uh, and, and that's is uh, is science fiction about predicting the future? Ah, uh, yeah. If so, if so what, what kind of a job has it done? Okay. And who wants to who wants to take a swipe at that one? Well, my my personal belief would be that, that it's not really about predicting the future. That's not really its purpose. Uh, it, it, we're using the future as a uh, just as a means of, of tackling other issues or making, shining a light on our present day society and that mostly science fiction hasn't been very good at predicting the future but you know, that's my point of, my yeah, point of view. I, I agree that you know there have been a few hits and we, we, we tend to emphasize the successes uh, you know 1984 had the, the vid screens in every house well down today, these days we all have a TV, multiple TVs in every house right uh, and uh it's more like the webcams in every house is more webcams in every house and and mr robot they've got they're hacking into the webcams so they can spy on people 
um, and seek very, you know, <laughs> with with considerable effect. Uh, the uh, yeah, but but you know, you look at that. You look at mo- the vast majority of science fiction. You you look at like the Foundation series, which is a justly famous series. To me now, it seems the notion of using pure mathematics to to predict social trends is just silly. But you know, this was before the days of chaos theory or complexity theory. Uh you know, he, Asimov had his had his uh, psycho historians writing equations on a blackboard and then figuring out what was going to happen in the galaxy. Uh, and yeah, I think but they, that, but they don't always get it right, do they? I mean, no. that's the whole business of, of the mule coming in and uh, and throwing things off off track. So it's, it's not. Uh, you know, he does see that it's not necessarily going to work as as neatly as that. Yeah, but they were they were way more successful than I think they should have been, <laughs> even then, you know. Or, or his three laws of robotics, which are now uh, a lot of people don't think will will go anywhere. Uh, that's a, that's a area of active debate in our own society right now. Is what should we do with robots, and how is there any way to really control what they do, and how how and to whom? <laughs> um, it's a pretty good template, though, isn't it? The three laws of robotics. It would be good if we could force robots to do that. Yeah, the, the you know the uh, I think the three laws of robotics uh, are a pretty good ex- explanation of what we'd like robots to be like. And he's he wrote a lot of stories about uh, the challenges to those three laws, the, the various problems you'd run into. Um, that that was John W. Campbell's suggestion, you know, that that uh, he, Asimov was writing stories about robots, or was trying to write stories about robots and sell them. And uh, Campbell sort of pointed out to him that that without some sort of constraint, then it was hard to to write a good story. And I th- I'm pretty sure it was Campbell who suggested that that there were these these laws, whether he actually himself wrote the laws, but he suggested that there be constraints on 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 ro- on robot behaviour because. Up until then, stories had been about robots. Had all been about robots running amok and creating mayhem, and it was the 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 introduction of of those laws as a constraint that made you made it possible to write really quite interesting stories, playing around with it, with those with those constraints. So it, w- it was the the addition of the constraints which actually made made Asimov's stories successful. Yeah, but now I think our robots, instead of being, uh you know, bipedal things rolling around on the floor are servers on a server farm somewhere that are, uh, we don't even see them. And their effect is far more important than anything that, that Asimov's robots could have dreamt of. Uh, well, what, what people are now calling 3D printers are just simply automated manufacturing, and it's a, that's the same sort of thing where, where the, the automated factoring is, 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 is arriving bit by bit, slowly, at small scale, uh, moving up from plastics, and now there are a few that, that can work with metals and do both subtractive and additive manufacturing. So it's coming true very slowly and not in the form of, like you say, bipedal walk around human resembling robots like the famous uh, evil robot in Metropolis that uh, looks like a woman. Yeah, well. <laughs> well, I mean, I, mean, I, I see both sides. Um, I sort of agree and sort of disagree. In other words, to the question about, about predicting the future, I don't think science fiction specifically is written to predict the future, but there are science fiction writers that write to do that on purpose, like I, like you said with the iRobot, eyes most and stuff like that. Um, but generally speaking, I think most science fiction uses sort of speculative, predictive thoughts to try and write a good sci-fi, to use uh, technologies that may not exist yet but are plausible, that sort of thing. Uh, but I think it's wrong to say a science fiction is, is, is strictly predicting the future. I think there are things in it that a good science fiction writer who has a science mind might see some technologies possibly coming forth and using them in his story, his or her story, excuse me. Uh, but, uh, I mean, there are obviously stories that are written to predict the future, you know, like the Terminator and stuff like that, uh, uh, iRobot and all that, you know, about robots. And 
things of that nature. 1984, which is really a post-apocalyptic kind of thing. Uh, uh, well, actually, 1984 is not post-apocalyptic. It's it's more well, yeah. di- it's dystopian, but uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. It's dystopian, uh, uh, more politics than it is science fiction. But nevertheless, um, you know, in other words, there are stories or there are writers that write towards predicting what the future might be like. Yeah. Uh, address the politics saying, if we don't do something about this, uh, this is what it's going to look like. Well, it's a possible future, right? Not necessarily might, the or, future. Or fair, maybe, fair, maybe fair, maybe fair. Fair. I want to be more simplistic, Fahrenheit 451 was – Basically, a, a story written to to say, you know, read people, <laughs> you know, don't let them burn so you. More, more than but, predicting the future, it's more of a warning. Yeah, that's that's right. If if this goes on, let, let's not go to this future. Let let's let's right. try and avoid this future. And surely that's what 1984 was about. Right. You know, yeah. we don't want to go well, here. Science fiction in general was is is designed or written solely to predict the future i think it just does that by chance most of the time and sometimes it is specifically like you know eisenhoff and stuff like that but it's not in general it's not always like that one theme that came up many times at the first uh, 100 year starship uh, study symposium in 2011 was science fiction as as a thought experiment in this future, and that's another way to to think of it. Without you don't have to think of it in terms of prediction. That um, there are many different thought experiments and what the future might be like, and some of them might be warnings, some of them might be escapist fantasies, but they're all, or they could be thought experiments in the past too, because some science fiction is set in the past. Yeah, and and some science fiction is set in the present, right? I mean. Uh, True. Yes. Or, or it becomes the present very quickly. <laughs> uh, you know. Um, or it never becomes the present at all. It yeah. permanently verges off well, as I, something that can I, no longer be uh, re- realized. Yeah. One thing I read recently was uh, William Gibson's pattern recognition, which is not. It's it's a strange bird. It's not really science fiction, but it's really not not science fiction. Uh, uh, and I, I recommend having a look at it. it it's it's really post nine eleven uh, fiction. Uh, it's really set in the last decade, but uh, it proposes a the internet is is a, a critical part of the story, and uh, so I won't. I mean, it, it's a complex story that takes place in New York, Moscow, London, and Tokyo. But um, yeah, it, it, it's kind of like taking all of everything that we learned from doing science fiction and making it a present day f- fiction. Uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting idea, though, because we're entering the Internet of or the Internet of Things, where you know your fridge is hooked up to Google and can order your milk and beer and whatever else so how is something like that going to actually alter how sci-fi is written 10 years in the future yeah, I mean, even five yeah. years in the future i think since 1995 we've been in this on this future shockwave that nobody really knows what where it's taking us uh and maybe even before then i just didn't see it before then but uh when people i remember the first time html came out and I looked at it and said, well, this is so easy. Anybody can do this, which is what Tim Berners-Lee had in mind, that anybody can do it. He didn't have, uh, and, you know, it revolutionized everything. Uh, it Unintentionally. We just wanted to well, find a better way for scientists to collaborate. And if, I, we're and I, about, if we're talking about prediction, did, did, you, did anyone successfully predict the internet, do you think, in science fiction? Uh, not that I know of, although, well, I mean, when, well, did, when did his game come Star out? Star Trek. When did what? Ender's game come out. Uh, late eighties. That, that was, I mean, discussion, internet discussion groups were extremely important in that story. Yeah, Ender's I game mean, um, was a, was a story that was written further back than the formic wars, which the formic wars, it's like, uh, 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 what do you call it? Um, publishing order is different than the actual chronological order. 
uh, uh, Ender's Game is actually the end, almost the end. Well, it's the end story, but uh, the, the the Formic Wars, the three books that uh, start with uh, Earth Unaware, then Earth of Fire, and Earth Awakens. Which well, is, there was Speaker for the Dead, which came after that, right? But uh... yeah, there was one I can't remember. That might be it. Um, but uh, those three are particularly the the prequels to the Ender's Game, which were written in the 2000s. Yeah, but Ender's Game itself was written in the 80s. Right. Before anybody... No, I mean, th- th- there there were Usenet well, groups, uh, I guess, in the early 90s, but nobody was really on the internet in the, in the 80s. At least uh, there were a few, a few geeks who knew something about ARPANET or DARPANET, but... Uh, Gopher. Yeah. Well, Programs what, like about, what about... All knowing computers, like on Star Trek, you can ask computers on the ship almost anything, and it can pull up the information. I and want to. I want to see like a Star Trek episode where they say Siri <laughs> 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 instead of computer. <laughs> uh, or I can do the same thing with my with my uh, with my Android device. But uh, yeah, I mean that was actually. I mean. Th- Star Trek is actually pessimistic. I mean, they have this, you know, this stuff, that stuff came, is coming along much sooner, right? You can, you can now say, yeah. Hey Siri, you know, uh, <laughs> how many yeah, miles do we get? Well, in Oklahoma. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, I, I, asked, I, see I asked questions. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, like I said, I was, Talking to uh, Pat about it. You're starting them off it. young with Bat as Batman geeks, huh? I was <laughs> actually that yeah. that was Colin's idea. I was oh, okay. We should point out that uh, James is showing us a picture of his family, <laughs> and they're all wearing Batman T-shirts. Okay. I like. Well, that. even the ba- Batman, even the babe, even the baby, the baby right, right there. Yeah, yeah that's cute. No. Yeah, and then like I said, Colin's room. He's gotten obsessed with the superhero and it's happened organically. I did not, I had wanted him to be interested in what I wanted him to be in, you know, whatever he wanted to be. Yeah. So I didn't talk about the superheroes that I like and everything. And now he's uh, one of our big, uh, which is something I was going to say is where would you put superheroes in the, you know, some of these, but uh, we watch the flash every week and now we're starting to watch Supergirl and, not not Green Arrow. It's a little violent for a six year old, but yeah, you know, he he loves those shows and he's got a big collection of superhero stuff. His entire room is decorated out Spider Man red and blue, and <laughs> he's got good taste. Spider Man's my favorite. You know, uh, my son yeah. as well. He was born in two thousand and four. Uh, he he's largely found his way through gaming and. Uh, the characters he's he likes are in games, and games are have really become, in some ways, sort of the new science fiction. Uh, in, in science fiction, you can interact with. Um, yeah. And, yeah, I can think of a few outstanding sci-fi games that I've played. I mean, I still like personally, I like Final Fantasy the most, but yeah, a lot of the ones, that, a lot of the other ones, they definitely fall under sci-fi. Yeah, uh, and, and or fantasy worlds where you can build your own world, like Minecraft, uh, where uh, a lot of children, boys and girls, but virtually every boy <laughs> these days spends hours and hours and hours immersed in the Minecraft world. Uh, He's going to have to fill up those shelves with some books, man, or something. Oh no, they you, I. He's I six. Can bring the computer <laughs> in and show you his. And give me just a second. I will show you his library. He has got. I'm loving this. I'm loving. It. Oh, Spider- just wait. You, a, 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 well, you remember the old Spider, the original Spider-Man cartoon, right? Back. In oh the- yeah. Well, the Charles Mingus theme. Yeah. Sure. And that stuff going on. Da 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 da. da. That, 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 that is Colin's library. Wow. Right there. That, that's those pretty good for books. a six year old kid. Wow. Well, mine. those over there are mine. <laughs> and he's got a big pile of them in his room. Those are the Anne McCaffrey books of mine. He's right. gotten where he likes those. He reads wow. them himself, or does he? No, he he's 
if he wanted to, he could, but then this is one of his favorite ones. So he's way past first grade reading level then. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, nah, he's, he's about on par with first or second, which given that he's in kindergarten is pretty good. But this one right now is one of his favorite. Wow. So. Uh, <laughs> excellent. Excellent. I'm uh, James is showing us a star Wars collection here. Uh, okay. Oh, no. That- that's just one of them. This whole bookcase here is pretty much Star Wars. Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, I told you I had a lot of them. So you're oh, you're, and I just saw you're raising an you Uber guys? geek. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, well, I don't know if you hadn't noticed my shirt or not, but yeah, maybe slightly. <laughs> but uh, but no, where would you guys put uh, Jerry Brooks in the? Sci-fi or fantasy spectrum. I'm oh, sorry, Terry. Who Terry? Who? I was going to say that the Terry Brooks cartoon was the artwork, the way they did it at, in those days. Um, you could actually see in the cartoons where he was like holding onto air. He was stuck to the wall, but it was like one of his hands were in the air. They were using these. Mm-hmm. Um, what do they call those things when they when they do the drawings? Um, uh, and they were basically piecing them together to make the to, to make the motion cartoon, and uh, you can spot all those strange mistakes. But the artwork was 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 actually beautiful if you really looked at it. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, uh, by the way, uh, the, the the original Spider-Man cartoon theme that is a uh, Boogie Stop Shuffle by Charles Mingus, <laughs> with okay. words put with words put to it. <laughs> And Charles Mingus, one of the great geniuses of jazz of in the fifties and sixties. Yeah, so I keep remembering all that jazz music throughout the entire cartoon. Yeah. Uh, well, mm-hmm. now go out and buy go out and buy all the Mingus CDs. Have to I write require that. it. M I N G U S. I remember it now. <laughs> I'm just I'm just messing with you guys. I... There, there's there's a scene in. Uh, that some Tom Cruise movie that I've hopefully for almost forgotten where they're playing. Charles Mingus is playing and he looks up and he goes, what is this music? <laughs> Which <laughs> just convinces me that the character is an idiot, but, uh, <laughs> uh, so now, uh, where does now these guys, these days we are all old men. Uh, <laughs> Except for, Ouch, except for James, except for James, who's kind of a young guy, <laughs> a baby. Uh, uh, what, where, you know, you've had a life with science fiction coming and going. What, where do, does it? How does it affect you now? Where, where does it take you? Does it? I mean, uh, Dave, David. Hurt. Let's start with David, who's actually writing science fiction. <laughs> well, I'm I'm writing a little of it. Um, I, I guess I, the, the science fiction that still appeals to me is 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 the stuff that really makes you you think a lot. Um, I've been quite enjoying Anne Leckie's uh, ancillary sword trilogy. Ancillary was ancillary justice was the first book in the in the trilogy, um, where she has a an intergalactic sorry an interstellar society in which um, the culture makes no distinction between the genders, even though people do have gender, unlike the um, left hand of darkness. Uh, the language doesn't distinguish between the gender, and that's that's she does that for her quite cleverly, I think, so that you actually get to the point where it re- honestly doesn't matter what the gender of the characters are, uh, and which is probably as it should be. So that's, that's really interesting stuff. Um, who else I've been reading? I read quite a bit of Neil Stevenson. Um, it's, it's varied, I think, in, in quality, uh, depending on, I don't think his later books are all that great, but some of the earlier stuff, uh, Snow Crash, of course, is, is a great classic of the genre. Uh, and that's probably a, a cyberpunk or cyber, cyber SF, one of the earlier cyber SF, uh, stories, um, uh, Snow Crash and, uh, the Diamond Age, uh, they're great, great books. Um. What I, the kind of stuff I'm trying to write is still very much myself is is still very much stuff uh, written in society like our own or in our current society with just a, a few things changed. I currently have a, a novel in draft which is um, 
set in a different uh, environment, if you like, but the, the culture is roughly, I guess, Edwardian style level of technology. Um, but it's in a world where, uh, I won't go into too much detail, I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but uh, it's set in a world where there is no distinction between night and day. And so that's just just trying to play with with those ideas as to what society might be like that uh, would be in a situation like that. So yeah, it's it's still the science fiction that um, uh, that makes me think and you know makes me wonder what what it would be like to live in a place like that or a scenario like that. That's the kind of science fiction I like to to read and to write. Now, James, you mentioned Akira, which is like a uh, that's a like a anime. Right. Yeah, it's a cyberpunk uh, dystopian future evil government slash corporation type thing. I've you know, I can eat, yeah. I've probably yeah. watched it at least ten or fifteen times. I, I love the movie. I'm I mean it is excellent. It has got even to this day, after what, 25 years or so, it's still probably one of the best animated movies I've ever seen. Hmm. A little gruesome, but it's still an excellent. I've only seen it once, but I remember the, uh, yeah, very violent, uh, which, of course, pretty much every movie <laughs> I've seen recently. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, Yeah, but even the stuff that's coming out today doesn't match it in terms of sheer gore and violence i mean this that movie even back then back then it was unprecedented i think a lot of i remember hearing stories about it was banned from being watched because it was you know banned from being shown because it was so violent hmm. and even to even today i mean it's still it'll hold its own against any slasher horror movie. i remember well robocop was uh had had to go through a lot of cuts before it got was able to come out with an R rating. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was so violent, and it wasn't sex; it was violence, uh, mm -hmm. extreme. Uh, violence. Real tape. I'm gonna have to watch it now. Oh, yeah. yeah well, I, th I, I I've seen it only once, but I thought it was. I don't uh, remember. A, a, kind of yeah. surreal, but really, you know that that's how all the Japanese anime appears. You know, sort of comes across yeah. to me as kind of surreal. Uh, uh, but uh, they have a different rules for storytelling than we do. So it's kind of uh, the way they, the what we consider continuity, they do not. Uh, they have different ideas, but... Um, yeah, they kind of jump right... I mean, a lot of them just jump right into the story. Neon Genesis Evangelion. Um, what is... I've got, I've got Angel Hearts. Or, I can't remember. I've got quite a few. I, I love anime. I love manga. So... Uh, yeah. Well, like Vampire Hunter D, that would be, I, I think that would actually fall under sci-fi because it's 25,000 years in the future, human technology kind of went nuts, but they've got massive machines and all sorts of tech doing stuff, but then they've also got vampires. Well, of course they have vampires. <laughs> 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 I mean, the vampires are the actual technological masters of the planet. They control the tech. Ah. Oh. So it's it's kind of an if you haven't if you haven't a lot in it's a pretty cool manga to watch. Well, that, this raises a this raises the issue that uh, you know uh, a lot of people who are scientifically oriented tend to take things very literally, right? But a lot of literature is not meant to be taken. At face value, right? Uh, uh, yeah. You can't you can't read Animal Farm. Well, a lot of times, I just <laughs> yeah. I find out a lot about Jeff. So a lot of times, I just use use it as a escapism. I mean, I'm not looking for meanings. I'm not looking for deeper truths or you know possible futures. I'm looking primarily for entertainment value. Yeah. Value. That's why. What was the book you were discussing earlier? Uh, Neuromancer. Yeah, I have, tr I have tried reading it. It's rare when I find a book that I can't finish. It's rare when I find one that I can barely start. There's just something about that book. I cannot read it. I've tried a half dozen times at least, and it's just I'll get three or four pages into it and just kind of it's a little trippy. Yeah. Yeah. 
But I found out a lot about Japanese anime from from even, even Ghost in the Shell, and stuff. it's always some spiritual, um, um, you know, evangel. What do you call that? That that one that even um, neon neon Genesis Evangelion. Evangelion, yeah, that that, that was a cartoon. They think was- Pacific Rim thirty years before. It's always Pacific Rim. Always spiritual in some sense. There's always some spirit thing going on. There's always some kind of uh, uh, religious thing about it. You know, the vampires being the t- like you said in another one. Uh, there's always some kind of um, wushu going on with with their with their so-called sci-fi. I, I've always found that about that Japanese anime, but it is Japanese anime. It is cartoon after all, and they've got their own methods. But uh, yeah. I mean, a lot of the stuff I've watched, I don't. I'm not picking up any kind of a religious over or undertone. You have to a lot of the guys that Evangelion is Shinto. It's about it's about. Uh, a ghost in the machine is about the, a spirit in the in the machine. You know, it's it's about a ghost. You know, it's no, no. It's about a human. It, that ghost in the machine is about a human psyche in a cyborg's body. It's not about a spirit. It's about her brain is inside of a cyborg body. Yeah, you're right. You're right about that one. I have. It's been a while since I watched them. I guess. Yeah, when when they say ghost in the machine, they're just meaning uh, a bug or just oh. it's kind of like Duce. Was it Duce Machina? Yeah, like the eye rope, cost in the machine kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I got that one wrong, but you know what I'm saying. A lot of it, a lot of it, a lot of it has to do with some sort of. Um, well, some of it does, but then again, you also have to look at uh, they're doing they're translating it for an American or an English speaking audience. That's true too. So concepts that they have in Japan, we don't have in a lot of the English speaking world. So instead of saying uh, that this is an ogre. They'll call it a demon, or you know things like that. So I, Evangelion, yeah, there's a little bit of religious tone, but mostly it's about giant robots smashing monsters into bits. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> what could be better? <laughs> uh, okay, let, let's move on to uh, yeah, Nick. Uh, when you read science fiction these days, what what is it? Does it have any impact on your thinking at all? Uh, yes, it does. Um, even though I just said a little bit ago that it's been a very long time since I've read a novel through, I should mention that um, I, I do go back and listen through as a book on CD some of my favorite novels that I read when I was younger to see if, if I can still enjoy them and, and what they uh, what they mean to me now. I recently listened all the way through Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End. Ah. And I think that is really one of the best visionary science fiction stories to be read. But uh, just earlier, Paul, you were saying about how you know, we don't have to wait for the future because it's forced on us every moment by the present. And that's one of the ways in which Clarke's execution of the idea suffers because all of the technology that we now take for granted in terms of telecommunications and the internet its absence from that story is 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 almost almost striking. The 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 the, the technology used by the overlords in the novel, uh, it it, uh, uh, it 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 when they especially when they search for the guy who's been kidnapped, it it it, it comes across as a little awkward in its execution. Execution, although the 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 arc of the story is wonderful and it's a very visionary story, and I still enjoyed that. Uh, I also recently went through, uh, this may sound a little bit campy, but one of my favorite books was uh, H. Beam Piper's Space Viking. And uh, I've reread that book many times in the past. I recently reread it. And although parts of it are still pretty darn campy, I, I, there were some embedded discussions of what he calls the de-civilization pro- process. Uh, and the, the the theme of space Viking is is a collapsed uh, interstellar civilization where there's raiders like Vikings who go out to these worlds where civilization collapses. So H. Beam Piper weaves into this discussions of the collapse of civilization and how it happens differently in different places. Mm-hmm. And I also recently um, listened through all of Niven and Pornell's The Moat in God's Eye, which is um, a very well constructed novel. Uh, that I w- still was still was interesting to me. So those are three that uh, I recently reviewed again and and had different reactions to. 
Yeah, I, I remember the moment in God's Eye from my teenage years uh, being a really fascinating novel. Uh, lots of orbit mechanics in that. It kind of got me into my my career. <laughs> lots, of, lots of lots of what mechanics? Orbit mechanics. Uh, orbit mechanics. Yeah. Well, yeah. Starships screaming into a solar system at different speeds. And, and and talk about science fiction as prediction in that novel. His his characters are always whipping out their pocket computers, which we now have long before we have interstellar space travel. Yeah. <laughs> Thing is, well, you know, in twenty years we won't even have pocket computers; just be built into our, into our necks. Uh, but uh, one of one of the fun things about Heinlein's novels, particularly his juvenile novels, is that the uh, the people on board their spaceships whip out slide rules to calculate their orbits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, slide, slide reels are very present in in, in Heinlein and several of the other writers of his generation. Slide reels are very useful. Uh, I'm pretty good with one, and they are. Uh, you don't have to worry about the battery running out. Uh, <laughs> I think they're going to make a comeback. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, let's see what about Time Bandits? Is that is Time Bandits science fiction? I I don't think of it that way. I don't think anything Terry Gilliam does is, is has a has a genre. <laughs> I, I think it's I, I don't know. That that is a guilty pleasure of mine. That is one of my favorite movies, but it's time travel, it's little people, it's I mean it's it's priceless. I've always thought of it personally as a sci fi movie myself. I mean, right oh, really? I mean it, it's one of my pleasures like like Buckaroo Bonsai. You're talking both of those don't be talking about my buckaroo now. <laughs> oh no, I, I love both of those movies. I will sit and watch them. It's almost three movies. If I catch them on at any point, even the last five minutes, I stop to watch them. And it's Time Bandits, Buckaroo Banzai, and The Incredible Mr. Limpet. Oh, uh, well, you know, I don't I, care I, what time it is. I will finish them. I like Time Bandits, but I don't think of it as science fiction. I think of it as just Terry Gilliam messing with my head. Uh <laughs> Just, just, just like, uh, uh, gosh, what was that movie he did that was so dystopian? Um, Brazil. Brazil, Brazil, Brazil is wonderful, but it's, you know, it, it's kind of like uh, his own version of 1984. Uh, but uh, with I, lot, I would call that science fiction. Yeah, uh, it's very cleverly done movie, but it's not. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, Spaceballs isn't science fiction either. I quote for Spaceballs all the time. You know, uh, well, can, can parody be science fiction? Sure, why not? Well, you know, th- 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 that leads me just to Douglas Adams. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, well, he didn't really write parody, but uh, I'm gonna, I was going to get to that sooner or later. <laughs> but, what, what, let, let's leave Douglas Adams kind of out of this for now. Uh, I just want to say that uh, because that's a whole that's a whole episode. Uh, <laughs> that's comedy. That's, that's almost a whole podcast. That, yeah, well, you you could do. I mean, Douglas Adams' stories are so full of ideas, of interesting ideas. You could just you could just mine it forever. Uh, but uh, is it science fiction? Well, kind of but sure, sure it is brilliant it, the imp- it, improbability drive come on well <laughs> it I mean, is, it is, i'm just thinking about learning how to fly you just missed the ground exactly precisely the way that bricks don't right <laughs> <laughs> no uh uh Master- well, that, that has to do with the way the spaceships hovered above the earth but uh mm. yeah you, you, you throw yourself to the ground and you miss <laughs> that's how you fly <laughs> Well, but there, there, there's, there's a rich tradition of, of comic science fiction, you know, going back to um, uh, people like Frederick Brown and and, uh, and earlier than that. Uh, you know, so it's it's not you you can't sort of say well because it's funny it's not science fiction. I agree. There's lots of quite funny. Robert Sheckley, for example, a lot of very very funny short stories set in definitely science fiction environments. Yeah, well, Isaac Asimov would occasionally write a humorous story. Uh, sure. Uh, there was one story where where a group, a bunch of aliens come into the solar system and buy Jupiter, uh, uses a giant billboard, <laughs> uh, 
and of course, the, the name of the story was By Jupiter. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> There's a there's a prediction for you. Once once the uh, once the big corporates uh, get the ability to do it, we'll have billboards on the moon. <laughs> well, why not? I mean, you know. Well, that that already figures in in several several of Heinlein's juvenile stories. But the man who sold the moon uh, talks about all his machinations to get financing for his moon venture, and one of them is to to put the the slogan of a of a soft drink soft drink beverage manufacturer uh, on the surface of the moon. And uh, Nick, who is Ron Goulart? I don't think I've heard of him. Uh, he was, he wrote a, uh, a, a few um, science fiction novels, I think in the, in the, in the seventies that were um, basically m- making fun of the genre from within the genre. Ah, yeah. Okay. Uh well, not a famous name. Much as Terry Pratchett makes fun of the whole uh, fantasy genre. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, he, he's kind of stopped doing that after he got to the first couple of books, and then he, he just started doing his own thing. But uh, the first the first Discworld book is makes fun of all the sword and sorcery stuff in a really uh, outlandish way. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, who else... Before we want, to, who wants wants to say something before we go through our last final round here? We're, I mean, I I don't care that we're uh, an hour and sixteen minutes in. We can go longer. You guys can say whatever you want. Patrick, did you want to say something? Um, I was just thinking. Um, I was just going to say, you know, the, the the there's there's parody and then there's comedy sci-fi. I think there's a difference i mean uh space balls was a parody it is comedy and it's a parody on a sci-fi but um um yeah what's his I mean, name john rivers is a robot come on <laughs> it, 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 i i love space balls it, it's very funny i mean but but uh, what do you she, you mean she wasn't a robot <laughs> well i i don't have an opinion on that but uh no, but uh, you know, just just like uh, Blazing Saddles was not a really a western. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should just do an episode on Mel Brooks movies. Mel, Mel, well, uh, I'm a big yeah. fan of Mel Brooks. Spaceball. I, he's done yeah. some great. He did some great stuff in his career. He's still still with us. Yeah, but, but then, yeah, Blazing Saddles is another one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. The end of the series was. Well, but you know, uh, the producers is not really a Hollywood, a Broadway musical either. You know, <laughs> well, but see, yeah. the restaurant at the end of the universe and the, and the two before were, were, were they were they weren't they were they weren't just comedy. They were comedy for sure, and they were brilliant. But they were definitely sci-fi. It wasn't a parody. It was his own work. You know, but uh, it was definitely sci-fi. I mean, there was brilliant, you know, uh, uh, ideas in there, making jokes of quantum physics and stuff. I mean, the guy is brilliant. Yeah. So I mean, it's definitely there's definitely room, for, a lot of room for comedy and sci-fi. Well, I guess my my point is that that these genre boundaries are not that important. Right, right. And, I mean, there is a difference between parody, and, and it's okay to it's okay to smash through a genre boundary uh, if you do it with yeah. enough wit. <laughs> mm. Right. What uh, about what about Galaxy Quest? Oh yeah, that's Galaxy another. Quest the movie that's very very funny, but it is SF. Don't know that one. It sounds familiar, but I don't know it. Galaxy Quest. You haven't that's, seen that's Galaxy Quest. Flesh Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> I won't give you any spoilers oh. on that one, but uh. <laughs> Not flesh. Oh, just just the porn, the just the sci-fi porn is its own <laughs> whole own genre. I don't think that's been. I don't think that's been done enough properly by the right people yet. Uh, <laughs> But I, let's not go there anymore. Okay. I'm starting to lose, yeah, starting to lose listeners right now. Jesse James doesn't live that far from me. <laughs> Who doesn't? Jesse James. Oh, yeah? Jesse Jane. Oh. Yeah, she, she moved back to Oklahoma not a few years ago, and she comes in for, where I work every once in a while. Hmm. Somebody had to point her out to me. <laughs> I didn't, I, am, I honestly didn't know who she was. And he was drooling, and she 
asked him multiple times to leave her alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's probably got a lot of a lot of experience in asking people to leave her alone. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, that would be a weird link to put on this uh, on this episode. Just look here for all your naked robot people. Um, you know, I, I I used to live in Los Angeles where you could go to see uh, any movie you wanted, basically any time you wanted. Uh, mm-hmm. Theaters like the New Art uh, showed essentially. If you wanted to see a Kurosawa movie, didn't matter which one it was, you could you just wait a week or two and they'd have it on there. Uh, so, uh, and probably a good print too. They were pretty stringent about that. And uh, so, and I believe the New Art's still still there on Santa Monica Boulevard. I have to check on that, but um, the uh, you know, so I, I saw everything, <laughs> including Flesh Gordon once, uh, to, just to see what <laughs> if it was possible. <laughs> it was not the most hardcore porn you've ever seen. By well, I, I don't know what you've seen, but uh, <laughs> it wasn't that pornographic. It was it was kind of I gave up on that stuff a long time. Ago. It was kind of midland pornographic. <laughs> yeah, at least he's not asking the ones we've been in. So. <laughs> Oh well, uh, uh, that that you got to come come clean on. I I need to know. <laughs> yeah, that's all on IMBD. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so we go around one more time, and and uh, you can you can say any last words you want, but I also want you to give me a recommendation. This is going to be our sort of our new feature. It does not have to be related to science fiction. It does not have to be related to anything in particular. Uh, it could be a website. A blog, um, it could be a movie, it could be music, it could be a book, and just something you come across recently you thought was really cool and that, that you think needs wider recognition, and and not your own stuff because you know I know you're all creative geniuses, <laughs> but uh, if you want to plug your own stuff on here, you can also do that, but make that after your recommendation. So we'll start with. David Grigg. Okay. Um, do you want the recommendation now? Oh, yeah. yeah well, whatever. Or do you want the last words about science fiction? You um, can do it either, in order. About... Either order is all right with me. With me. Okay. Last words about science fiction, I guess, are just that it's uh, still a very interesting genre. Um, it's a genre which I still read quite a lot of, uh, but I guess in the last couple of decades, I've moved away to read more general uh, fiction. I've been reading uh, a lot of mysteries and uh, oh, just just generally I- interesting books uh, that that have come come around. But science fiction still remains a large part of my reading, uh, and uh, I think it probably always will be. But uh, it, it still makes me think, and that's the important thing about science fiction. As for the recommendation, I wanted to recommend probably the best book I've read in the last year, which is a non-fiction book. And it's called The Vital Question by Nick Lane. And it's the subtitle is Why is Life the Way It Is? And it's really all about uh, the origin of life uh, and the nature of, of life. And it, it's right on the edge of my ability to understand because I, I'm not that technically literate and don't have a great chemistry background. But I was able to keep with it the, the whole time. And he's he really looks at life. Uh, the origin of life from a, an energetic point of view of where the energy comes for, for to keep life going. And uh, I found it a really, really fascinating book, so I, I thoroughly recommend it. So that's The Vital Question by Nick Lane, and the subtitle is Why is Life the Way It Is? So that's, that's my recommendation. Right. Okay, The Vital Question by Nick Lane, which... Uh, Nick I, Lane, it is L-A-N-E. L-A-N-E, okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll have that in the show notes. Uh, somehow okay james james hello james um, um, hello yeah okay yeah, I'm, I'm, i was trying i was trying to think um just the way things go i don't have i'm catching up on a lot of stuff i'm trying to think nothing's happening <laughs> pretty much uh Something that, I mean, it just finished up, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't need the additional plugs, but uh, Scott Sigler, who 
I, I love his podcast, love his, love his books. And you want to talk about a, uh, you want to talk about hardcore sci-fi. He spends half of his research going to people in the fields that he's writing about and then takes it a step further just to give him that horror, that additional bump. But he's uh, writing a book, right? He's writing a book series right now. He just finished up the first one called Alive. It's n- nothing like, I mean, he's got a few plot twists in there that I didn't really see coming. So that, that would probably be my recommendation is okay. uh, Scott Ziegler's yeah. Alive. Right. Scott Ziegler's Alive. Is that S-I-G-L-E-R? Yeah, yeah S-I-G-L-E-R. It, he just finished up the free, and the cool thing is he does all of his books as a free audio book first. Oh. So he just finished up the audio book, and I think Alive is supposed to be out December or January, something like that. Hmm. But the actual paper book the actually paper book will be out later, but he's already, he just finished up the uh, audio book. Does he make a living like doing that or? Did... Yeah. Yeah. He just finished a uh, book series or a, another book on the GFL, the galactic football league where humans play football <laughs> with aliens. And. Okay. But New York best time, sir. He had released him all his free audio books first. Yeah, interesting. Okay, but it works for him. Yeah, uh, that gives me hope. Okay, uh, Nick Nielsen. <laughs> I'll uh, start out with a general comment about science fiction, which I think is uh, bound to be the kind of literature and film, cinema, as it were. That we're te- that we're going to have in the kind of technological civilization we have today. If you look back at the earlier epochs of civilization, culture was profoundly orientated toward the past. People imagined that there was a golden age when things were much better, and the present was measured in terms of the past. Uh, during the medieval period, the, many people thought that the that they were living at the, at the end of history and that everything great had happened and they were at the very tail end of things and looked back toward a better past. And uh, at some point when the modernity kicked in, uh, civilization went from being past oriented to being future oriented. Now in our highly technological civilization, people are very future oriented. So it's bound to be the case that we're going to be pursuing all these thought experiments in the future that science fiction represents. So I think the, the the growth of science fiction literature and especially cinema, which is very big business. And also somebody mentioned earlier games. Games are, uh, a, 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 in terms of dollar value, a bigger business than movies today, I think. And they are pervasively uh, science fiction oriented, some less so, but some very explicitly, uh, like Halo, for example, or the, the um, another one I can't think of. Uh, so that's the kind of literature that we're going to have and the kind of civilization we have. And I think we should expect that and expect more of that unless we have some kind of cataclysm that changes the nature of our civilization. Uh, as for recommendations, I'd like to, um, specifically in regard to science fiction, uh, I'd like to recommend the lectures by Professor Michael D.C. Drought, D-R-O-U-T, From Here to Infinity, an Exploration of Science Fiction Literature. That is produced by the Modern Scholar series, which is, I believe is a division of recorded books or something like that. And the same professor has also a series of lectures about uh, fantasy called uh, the Mo- uh, Swords, Monsters, and uh, Rings, Swords, and Monsters, excuse me. Both of them are, are a great series of lectures that go into uh, uh, both the theory and the practice of science fiction and fantasy and well worth uh, Uh, listening to. Uh, Can I make another recommendation? Um, Yeah, one more. (laughs) Non-science fiction orientated? Oh, yeah. There there is a website called The Conversation, which bills itself as having academic rigor but journalistic flair. And there was a gal by the name, the gal by the name of Lisa Sedaris wrote a uh, an article critical of big history called the problems with big history and turning science into myth. And then the, the guy who's the biggest in the field, David Christian, then about a week later posted 
big history why we need to teach the modern origin story. So the conversation in this case really is a conversation. We've got a, a pro and con opinion and big history that's uh, worth reading up on. Well, that's interesting. I know someone named Lee, Lisa Sedaris. I'll have to see if it's the same person. Uh, and okay. Uh, Patrick, you got to give me the next to last really awesome recommendation. Well, I got a couple actually. Uh, first, about the sci fi, um, science fiction genre in itself, let me lower the volume of stereo um, so that you don't get that uh, reverb. The science fiction genre in itself has changed. It, 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 there wasn't always a, a, a good following for sci fi. Um, I, I want to tell you about a story that turned into the movie um, um, The Day the Earth Stood Still. Uh, it was Harry Bates writing under a pen name, I believe, of H.B. Winston, I think, uh, for Astounding Magazine. Okay, I don't know if this website is available anymore, the library website, but Astounding Magazine, uh, basically with Harry Bates writing uh, the story Farewell to the Master, which became the movie um, 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 The Day the Earth Stood Still. But, it, but The Day the Earth Stood Still is a lot different than the actual short story. Um, I, if you're interested in, in the actual science fiction genre uh, uh, um, um, evolving into what it is today, um, I highly recommend looking up the story. I don't know if that particular website, the library, is there anymore, but I think you'll still be able to find it on the internet anyway. And it talks about the Astounding Magazine. It's a pulp fiction magazine. Uh, they used to call it Super Science uh, back in the 20s. And uh, um, and it, it, the Harry Bates story, the the uh, farewell to the master, uh, did a lot towards changing the genre into science fiction. Uh, as far as recommendation, you know, I mean, I recommend I recommend you look that up. Uh, but as far as actual writers' recommendations, I mean, if you like to read, and if you like it, and if you're a young person who grew up with Harry Potter, who is now an adult, um, I want to recommend continue reading J.K. Rowling even under her pen name and some people don't realize that she wrote uh, she started a new character um, 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 Cormoran Strike who was a private eye a war veteran um, but also she wrote one book after the Harry Potter that under her own name and these books are not for kids I'm going to repeat that these books are not for kids the first one was under J.K. Rowling's real name um um, a casual vacancy, and her pen name is Robert Galbraith. Um, she just finished a third book recently. I got it from the library, an audiobook. I do listen to audiobooks because I have trouble reading lately. But uh, um, the the books are uh, A Cuckoo's Calling, or The Cuckoo's Calling, um, Silkworm, and the last one I just got and, and, and listened to, um, A Career in Evil. Or a career of evil, I forget which. Um, but again, these books are not for kids. But it is J.K. Rowling, even though she's writing under the name Robert Galbraith. Uh, okay. So if you're interested in in, in J.K. Rowling's writing, as I am, uh, even though the Harry Potter stuff was kid stuff, uh, uh, the writing itself is very good writing. I mean, she's able to draw a picture in your head in a matter of a paragraph, where a lot of writers take a couple of pages to finally draw that picture in your head. So uh, definitely go for that. Uh, if you like the mystery stuff, you know, the Sherlock Holmes kind of stuff, you know, um, mystery. So, you know, murder mystery, that sort of thing. Yeah, well, yeah, well I, go ahead. Go ahead. I, that's, that's basically my recommendation. <laughs> oh, if, if, you, if you're interested in the uh, Ender's Game movie, uh, I recommend the Orson Scott Card uh, original story, which I haven't read the actual Ender's Game story yet, but I got the, the three uh, prequels which were written in the 2000s. That is the, um, I mentioned it earlier, the um, Earth, un Earth Unaware, uh, Earth of Fire, and uh, Earth Awakens. Right. right. Uh, well, yeah. Um, yeah what I would like to say for J.K. Rowling that I think she gave her young readers a lot of credit for being able to follow fairly complex storylines uh, in Harry Potter. Uh, I, I didn't, Stick. I didn't particularly enjoy the teen drama parts for that, but uh, <laughs> the uh, the actual storyline itself was uh, fairly complex. Um, okay, it's my turn. Um, by the way, James, anybody out there in Q and A? No. Okay. 
Uh, so, um, by the way, I'm not looking at the Hangout screen right now, so I can't see it. Um, okay. I got it. I was, just, I was trying to get it swapped over to it right quick. But yeah, I'm a bit nil on the questions. Okay, fine. Uh, if if you're out there on Q&A... Answered yeah. everything. Uh, <laughs> okay. I just wanted to... I'll, I'll make my recommendation very quickly. First of all, uh, I think I'd have no more to say about science fiction. We will, at some point, Probably as Towel Day comes close in May of next year, we will do a Douglas Adams episode. Uh, uh, I don't know if we're going to fold Terry Pratchett into that. The name of this podcast, by the way, comes from Terry Pratchett. The Unseen University, which is Terry Pratchett's marvelous invention from his Discworld novels, was the inspiration for the name of this podcast, The Unseen Podcast. Um, as you know, probably know, Terry Pratchett died right around just before, about a month before we started the podcast. And I was very, uh, you know, I missed him a lot and I missed his books and I wanted to do something to recognize him. So that's why uh, the name that was originally just a temporary name became stuck and became the name for the podcast. Um, so if you haven't read Terry Pratchett, by all means do. But that's not my recommendation. My recommendation, I'm going to I'm going to show you just how unrelated a recommendation can be to the theme of the episode. Uh, I'm going to recommend something that hit me a few months ago as a really great masterwork of our time that is really deserves wider recognition, which is ten. Freedom Summers by jazz trumpeter and composer Wadada Leo Smith. Now, I'm betting that about 99% of you have never heard of Mr. Smith or his music. Uh, it's This is not music for people who are jazz noobs or who have no uh, interest in the more creative sides of American music, but uh, Mr. Smith has been for many, many decades one of the great musicians and composers. And he now, uh, at an age where a lot of people would have retired, he has created his masterpiece. The uh, It's called Ten Freedom Summers. Uh, and uh, I, it's on Cuneiform Records. It's available uh, also on Pandora. And I would recommend you check it out. It's a very long, it's, it's, not, it's not music for kids, it's music for adults because it requires attention and listening and, um, you know, it, some of it goes in directions that you're probably not familiar with. It's, it's a very ambitious piece that involves orchestra and jazz ensemble, and the theme is built around the 1960s uh, civil rights movement, but it's all instrumental music. So check it out. 10 Freedom Summers by Without a Little Smith. Okay, I have, I'm going to bring now up now my points to hit. Every episode, I have a list of points to hit. And here's a couple of them. How you can help. Well, one of the things we'd like, we'd like to see for the Unseen Podcast is reviews on iTunes. Please, or whatever your podcast aggregator is, whether it's wherever it is, please go in there and give us a, spend two or three minutes and write a review for us. I'd we'd really appreciate it. Um, you can also support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash unseen podcast. If you want to, we don't, we don't want you to give us a lot of money. We want you to give us a very small amount of money, but we want many of you to do that. Uh, so, and that, money will go to support the podcast right now we are nowhere near covering our costs uh we'd like you to do that uh when we get to where we're covering our costs we'll go into trying to grow our audience through advertising uh none of the money will go into my pocket per se for discretionary spending uh although <laughs> that would be great uh if there was enough money to do that um we would really like to hear your feedback. 
we have a new Google Plus community for Unseen Podcast listeners. There's already been one for some time for people who want to participate in the Unseen Podcast. There's about 80 people in that community, about 20 of whom have actually been on the podcast. Well, I created a new one on Google Plus, and there'll be a, a link to it at unseenpodcast.com. And you can go there and you can ask questions, you can you can make suggestions, you can tell us we're full of it, whatever you want to do. Uh, a new look to the blog. We just recently updated the blog. It should hopefully look a little better to you. Go have a look at unseenpodcast.com. Please subscribe to the podcast. That makes things ever easier for everybody, including you. So take your favorite podcast aggregator, whatever that software is. I recommend Pocket Casts, but there are other ones that work well too. And if you have any problem subscribing to the Unseen Podcast, let me know and I will get it fixed. Okay. I'd like to thank everyone that's here tonight and... We have, from Australia, we have David Grigg. Hi, thanks for having me. We have James Garrison. You can say goodbye if you want to, James. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, was, I was trying to. My computer just didn't want to let me go. Okay. Well, your computer loves you too much. Uh, I think it prefers you to me. <laughs> Nick Nielsen. Thanks very much for the opportunity. And Patrick Festa. Pleasure as always. And I would uh, also, uh, but these guys have all been on before. I would really love to see some people who haven't been on before, uh, particularly women. We've had only three women on the panel so far, uh, even though we've had three fem- three women who have on special guests. So, uh, we should the panelists should outnumber the guests, I would think. So, uh, and thank you to Marsha, Chelsea, and uh, uh, gosh, I can't even think of who the third female panelist has been. But uh, thank you to them for being on. But we'd like more. So, if you're in the panel pool or would like to be in the panel pool, uh, you don't know how to get in the panel pool, just email unseenpodcast at gmail.com. I will help. You get onto there, it you will succeed and you will be great on the panel. Trust me. Uh, hosts. James has been a host. Adam Smith. Adam Synergy Smith has been a host. And I'm looking for three or four more people to host. Maybe three, four times a year. Not not a huge burden on your time or, or effort. Uh, so if you're interested in hosting... You've been on the panel once or twice, kind of got the feel of the thing. Uh, let me know, and we'll get you into hosting. No audio engineering expertise required. Uh, this has been episode 32 of the Unseen Podcast. Go to Unseen Podcast to learn more, and we will see you One week from today for episode 33. Good night.